<clears throat> okay, this recording is for the class on Friday, July 1st, and the material covered is Plato's Apology. So I'm going to be Socrates, the Apology of Socrates. So here I am. Um, all right, I'm going to tell you the story <coughs> of my life. Um, I was a working class person. My father um, was not a member of the privileged aristocracy, but he taught me to value our democratic system. And that's what I did. I mean, I, I think I was the greatest citizen that Athens had because I did exactly what you're supposed to do if you're a citizen especially if you're working class and you don't have the elite education. So you need to go out and talk to people every day. You, I used to go to the Agora, the marketplace. I used to check out what jury trials were being held. I used to check out what was going on in the assembly. And then I would go talk to people in that space provided. I thought it was wonderful. I, I was so blessed to have uh, lived in Athens. If I, as a working class person, if I'd been in a monarchy and an aristocracy, I would have no access. I would never be informed about public affairs. Um, so I made the best of it. Um, I, I was called in to serve in the military at one point, and um, I was considered, I got an award for fighting bravely in a dangerous situation, but I didn't care about that. I didn't really want my award. So I gave it to Alcibiades. Alcibiades was a member of the privileged class and he, I helped him as he was escaping when we were losing a campaign. He was on a, a horse because the privileged folk get to be on the horses and they don't, they don't die as, as easily. But anyway, I helped Alcibiades and I got this award and I just gave it to him because the point is I don't do this stuff to get awards because if you do, then the city is going to be able to recruit soldiers if they're, the wars are no longer defensive. If they become more offensive, they can just appeal to young people. Well, you'll get an award and the city will think you're so wonderful. And so they won't question. And I don't want my city state to go to wars for empire because then we're gonna lose our democracy. So what happened to us was, and you've heard this story before, we fought against the Persians um, and I was involved in that. And, and that was legit, right? The Persians came after us. It was, they were trying to make us part of their empire and we could fight back. I didn't want a government like the Persians where no citizens were engaged in participating in public life. It was just one demigod and you did whatever you were told. Nobody questioned anything or had a chance to. So I definitely was in favor of fighting in that war. Well, then as soon as that war got over, then the Spartans and the Athenians started to fight. And um, that was when things started to go south. Um, that was when I used to go out, my usual thing, go out to the Agora and start to question people. So uh, Plato has a number of dialogues that either are conversations I told him about because Plato was one of the young men who used to follow me around that it talks about in the apology. But um, I, there were conversations that he was not in on, most of them, but I told him about it. So earlier on, before Athens started to really decline, the aristocratic class, people in that class really respected me. It's kind of amazing, but that was what made Athens great, is that you didn't have to be born into a class in order to be respected. And so I was invited into the family of Lakes, who was a very respected general, and Nikias was there. And um, the, the older generation were kind of trying to figure out, well, how do we educate the youth to be um, virtuous, right? 
every generation has to educate the next generation so that they can lead the society forward. Well, um, the question was whether they should take these classes in a certain kind of military fighting with swords or something like that. And so uh, Lakey's thought it was a bad idea because the person who taught it actually was not a very good soldier and he blew it in, a, in war and Lakey, you know, just forget it. None of this theoretical stuff, plus none of this aristocratic training that only that doesn't make you a good soldier. Like I want, I want proof. <laughs> I want the guy with the boots on the ground that gets the job done. And this guy did not. So I don't want I don't want the young Athenians to take his class. And then um, Nikias, the other general, was famous for being a very good strategist. And he thought, oh yeah, it it will make it will make them appear to be more um, expertise, to have expertise, and that will maybe uh, intimidate the opponents. Plus, it's a great career move like you could move up on the military ladder, which is what Nikias did. He went from general to, from soldier to general to president of Athens, and he is the president while he's having this conversation. So he sort of sees military as a, as a path to a career, and he was very strategic. He was, he was very intellectual in his approach, and, um, he wouldn't go, he would not advise going to war unless you could win, okay? Whereas Lakey's was one of those, you know, put me in a dangerous situation. I'll prove to, that I can, you know, handle anything. Um, and the trouble is that each of those generals, uh, eventually they lost their reputation because of this false opinion. So I started talking to Lakey's about, well, what, what is courage if it's not, you know, taking these classes and developing these skills? Well, what is it? And Lakey said, it's standing by your post and doing what you're told. Well, the thing is, what if it's, what if you really shouldn't be in a war anyway? It's an unjust war. Do you get to question that? Or what if this particular military campaign is really brutal? I mean, do you ever hold back and tell your authority figures, we can't do this. Like you're asking us to slaughter people and I'm not gonna make my guys do that. Or what if it's motivated by money? What if you know that this war, the people on top are telling you to do it because they can get stinking rich if you do it. Are you gonna go along with that? Um, and Lakey's just could not answer those kinds of questions. He just thought, um, taking risks was what's cur courageous. And so I asked him, you know, well, so like with Nikias, he's a strategist. He tends to not go into a war unless he's figured out he could win. But is that courage? And like he says, no, that's not courage. I mean, it appears to be, but it's really cowardice because you know you're going to win. Well, so you should, what about like stupid courage, right? I mean, are you supposed to just do anything to, to prove that you can face danger? So he ends up with this um, view of courage, which is mindless risk taking. And he kind of knows that that doesn't sound right. Um, and Socrates says, well, Lakeys, um, how about if we question Nikias? And Lakeys goes, yeah, because he didn't really want to admit he didn't know. <laughs> but he thought, OK, if I'm going to get humiliated, I'm with you, Socrates. Let's go ask Nikias. Um, and it turns out in Lakey's life, he made that same mistake and he completely lost his reputation as a general because at a certain in a certain campaign, his guys were up at the top of the hill and the Spartans were down on the ground. And if you ever go to Greece, you know that you have strategic advantage, except he didn't have enough men. And so the Athenians were sending another group of men and he just had to wait until he got reinforcements. And this would be a no brainer, they would win. 
Well, then they're up there waiting. And you can, you can imagine what happened. Like Nikias is the older one, the general, and the young guys are just like chomping at the bit. Let's go get them. Let's go get them, Nikias. And then I'm sure they would go to him and say, come on, you turned into a, a woman. What are you, some kind of coward? Let's do it. And sure enough, Lakey's gave in to that. <laughs> Probably some told, someone told him he was, uh, you know, he was a coward, right? And so he did lead them down that hill and they ended up losing. And it sort of was a turning point in the war. And so Lakey's completely lost his reputation, but it was because he had the wrong idea of what courage was. Um, it shouldn't be blind obedience to the leaders and it shouldn't be just willingness to put yourself in a dangerous situation to prove how brave you are because those some of those situations you shouldn't be in <laughs> for various reasons. Well, then the keys, what is he? He's the professional soldier. And um, so when he's asked, what is courage? He says, well, courage is the knowledge of what to fear and what not to fear. And um, Socrates keeps pressing him on that. Is this uh, all good and evil, like everything? And he ends up with this very comprehensive view of courage is knowing everything about everything about what to fear and what not to fear. And Lakeys goes, Nikias, nobody knows that. What are you, some kind of a god? And so then Lakeys realizes that Nikias is the guy that he has to obey, right? Nikias is the president. And he's realizing, I don't like this guy, right? He was my friend. But he's sort of an arrogant elitist, you know? He thinks he knows all this stuff. And I have to sit here and, and do what he says. And all of a sudden it occurs to Lake, he said, wait a sec. Um, and Nikias, on the other hand, Lakey says, are you telling me I'm stupid? Because Nikias, okay, Lakey's thinks that animals can be courageous and children can be courageous because they do get in dangerous situations. And Nikia says that's ridiculous because courage has to involve being very aware of the situation and knowing how to act in the situation. You have to know everything. And um, so Lakey says, are you telling me you think I'm stupid? And Nikias goes, oh, no, no, Lakey's, you're wonderful. I love you. Because Nikias has to pander to him because he has to get him to go out and fight when he's ready to ask him to. So one of the problems with the military always has been this class split. There's the officer training school and the guys that go on to become officers and never really hit the boots on the ground. And then there's the guys that really face the danger. And when you separate them, which we have done, um, I think the last time we ever had a, a draft where you'd actually have a chance of having to fight, even though you're in the privileged class, was Vietnam. But a whole lot of, oh, more privileged people who ended up in the lottery, their number was being picked. They would be able to get a psychologist or psychiatrist to diagnose them as mentally ill, or Donald Trump got a doctor excuse me, a doctor to diagnose him as having uh, heel spurs, so he didn't have to go to war. George W. got his uh, dad to put him lower on the list, and he was just in the National Guard. I mean, there was all these ways that the lottery made it appear to be egalitarian, but it was not. Um, and then after that, we had a professional army. And so, so within that, army, there are just families who generation after generation are military. And I, I met one of them in an airplane once and I asked him, well, what do you think of the Iraq war? And he said, my family is military. Like, I don't question it, right? So then there's, I mean, it doesn't mean you have to disagree with the war. It's just that everybody has to be examining the issues about war 
and talking about it and finding out who's profiting from it and who ultimately has to risk their life. These are things that in a democratic society, the public should know and they should be engaged. And when you have just a professional military class and then you have everybody else who's, you know, their kids aren't gonna go to war or they make money off of war, that you're not gonna have a democracy anymore because citizens aren't informed and they aren't holding their leaders accountable for a just war. Um, anyway, so that class split plays out in the dialogue. And Nikias, it turns out, he loses his reputation because he ends up, he did not want to go on this campaign in Syracuse because he said, we can't win. We have too many, we don't have enough equipment and we're already fighting on two other fronts. And uh, he went in front of the assembly and said, no, we shouldn't do this. But then Alcibiades, this other guy was very charismatic. He just gets up there, oh, who's telling us we can't do it? We're Athens, we can do anything. You old, you know, you're just a coward. You're just this, you know, old fart, excuse me. Uh, you know, don't pay attention to Nikias. Let's go do it. Let's do it. Syracuse was the breadbasket. You know, the Athenians didn't like the fact that they depended on somebody else for their food. You know, they don't want to be vulnerable. So let's go get them. Let's go occupy it. So they went, and then um, it turns out Alcibiades got drunk one night and knocked down, destroyed some religious statues. And so he got banished. So then Nicias had to lead <laughs> the troops and he didn't even think we should be there. Well, on the way back, he was also a pious God, right? He believed in the gods and he really didn't think that Athens should be on this campaign. And so I think he thought, you know, the gods don't want us. This is over the over the edge. But I got to go. And so he fought, you know, strategically as well as he could. But then right at the end, when his troops were cornered at the sea and they really needed to get out of there, there was an eclipse of the moon. And the religious leaders said, the gods demand that we do nothing for two weeks. And because of that delay, Nikias thought he's going to trust the religious leaders more than his own strategic capacities. And the enemy came and absolutely wiped them out. So this is a case where uh, separation of church and state, right? You shouldn't have uh, military leaders who at the critical moment will refer to God and decide that God thinks they should do something that is again goes against every military strategic skill and uh, talent and rational capacity that he had that a person has but this happens so again I want you to try to think of analogies be, whenever I'm talking about things. But anyway, so I was there in the, in the house, we were talking about it. And both Lakeys and Nikias liked me because I did fight bravely in battle. And that's why Lakeys trusted me. And then I did, um, I was thoughtful, right? I wasn't blind obedience to a leader. And Nikias really liked that about me. So uh, by the end of the dialogue, both of them had to admit they didn't know. And of course, these mistakes turned out to be a mistake in their life. But they told, Socrates says to them, I think we should have the courage to admit we don't know. And that does take courage. If your career, if the public has trusted you with knowing something and being a professional, and you've been at it for 20 years, and all of a sudden come, somebody comes along and says, well, what is it you do? And what sort of skill qualifies you for this? Why should the public trust you with the power that it has given to you? And they can't answer. Then, then uh, it's, it's trouble. 
So I think in college, it's very important in college for you to decide, are you going to live an examined life for the rest of your life or not? Because the word sophomore in Greek means wise fool. So when you come to college and you make that transition from living according to reason, according to what your authorities figures say, and then uniting that with right reason, which we talked about before, was um, that you know your mother told you eat vegetables, and now you know why, and you should go to Ed's and eat your vegetables because you want to live according to reason, not because your mom's going to get mad at you or something else. Okay, um, but the other thing is to decide. Am I going to be intellectually honest? Am I going to admit I don't know? And uh, sophomores are good, wise fool. Like they can point out all these older people that think they know what they don't know. The trouble is it gets harder not to get defensive as you get older. So it's not true that the older you get, the more mature you get. As a matter of fact, you tend to get less mature on, you tend to get more defensive and less reflective about those very things that the public entrusts you with, okay? So you need to make a decision, just think about that. Will I live an examined life? Will I, what will happen if somebody questions what I've been doing that I have a reputation for doing well? What if I get exposed? I didn't know, I didn't know. And if I admit it, I'm gonna be humiliated. But if I don't admit it, <laughs> right, that I'm not gonna, I am, the public needs to know that I didn't know that. So it, it gets harder. That's why college is, is important. Um, so what happened to me is that was one example where I went into an aristocrat's house. I went to the gymnasium where the young people were uh, engaged in athletic activity. And I ended up talking to a bunch <coughs> of young people that was in the Car Carmody's dialogue. And earlier on, the elite respected me, which is again, is unique to Athens, no other city state. But as time went by, then there's the Mino dialogue. Um, at a certain point, and the Protagoras dialogue talks about this, there was a, you know, a nice sort of grandpa figure guy who taught, he was a, a foreigner, he came in and he taught rhetoric. He taught young people how to speak persuasively, but he didn't call it that. <laughs> He called it how to be a, a gentleman, right? Liberal arts education, uh, how to be a gentleman, how to be a respected member of the elite, right? Because if you are born with this privilege, you have to convince people that you actually earned it, you deserve it. But the skill that he taught was rhetoric, how to manipulate people's emotions, how to gain their trust, uh, so that you can do whatever you want. And Socrates would ask the sophists, well, do you also teach them about virtue and justice? And, and Protagoras and Gorgias say, well, I don't know, I'm a foreigner. I figure the Athenian, their parents teach them that. <laughs> I just teach them how to speak persuasively. Well, it turns out their parents are teaching them that this is the uh, people that are naturally irrational. And so going for money and power and all that, it's just natural. So you could do it and you can make us look good if you are successful. So I'm gonna hire the sophist so that you could actually be successful. The trouble is democracy depends upon people who care about the public good. And so the expectation was that parents expected their children to be successful. They paid money to these sophists to teach them to be persuasive. 
So the expectation level went even higher because now liberal education costs a lot more money. <laughs> and then, um, so they're pressured to just use the system for their own irrational purposes. And that is what destroys a democracy. So people, the Athenians had lost the spirit of democracy way before they actually lost it, in fact. Um, anyway, so, so I, oh, there's another drinking party I went to. That's a great story, right? There's all these other stories. The Republic is a story where I talked to Plato's two brothers. Um, one of the main themes in Greek education is that when a young person comes of age, the choice of Paris. Paris was given the golden apple, which is a symbol for their passion, their eros. And he has to choose. There's three goddesses that come and they want him to choose them. So Aphrodite wants him to choose pleasure and wealth. Because if you seek pleasure, you're going to have to have money to get it. Um, and then Hera said, if you choose me, I will give you power and glory. Because she's the wife of the king, right? So if you give it to me, I'll follow you in your career. You can be ambitious and I'll support you and I'll raise the kids and I'll have the dinner parties and the charity balls and whatever you want. And we'll get status and uh, power together. It'll be a team effort. And then Athena says, if you pick me, I'll give you wisdom and justice. Um, and so you do have to think about when you decide who you're going to get married to, or if you notice your parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, people you know, who, and you know their marriages pretty well, um, are people, do they grow together? Does it really affect you who you marry? So if you married um, Aphrodite, it would be one, pleasure and wealth. You, that's your common goal. And if it's Hera, it's money and power. But if it's Athena, probably this would be the, the partner, the girl or the boy that questions you every time you do something, uh, makes you accountable, doesn't blindly believe in you, um, and is dedicated to, uh, we got to make sure we're using our power justly. We have to make sure we're good parents. We're not abusing our power as parents. Just, you know. It's not going to be easy. <laughs> it's not an easy marriage, right? There's no worshiping the other person. It's constant dialogue, but it will keep you honest. Anyway, so Plato talks to, Socrates talks to Plato's brothers in the Republic. And one of his brothers is the one who wants power and glory. And one of his brothers is the one that wants wealth and um, pleasure. Okay, so. So there's lots of dialogues, but what was happening, as you can tell at the beginning of the apology, I said, okay, I'm going to have to defend myself in front of this jury, but I know that my real accusers started 20 years ago, these false rumors about me. So I know that there are false rumors about me and they will affect how you vote. So I want you, the jury, to just listen to me give an account of my life the way I understand it. And I'm not going to use rhetoric. I'm just going to tell you the truth. But you have to forget all those rumors that, you know, have been told about me. So then I ask my students, do you feel like there's ever false rumors spread about you? Do you feel like no matter what you do, people are going to believe these rumors and you can't prove yourself, right? Um, because once the rumors start, it's really hard to stop it. Anyway, so Socrates knew, I knew I was up against that. The other thing about me is, um, well, anyway, so I was doing all of that and I knew that Athens was declining. And then eventually we lost the war because I looked at those two military generals and I thought, this is not going to go well. <laughs> Neither one of them really has a grasp about what courage is. 
which is being able to lead people at that moment, right? You, you don't know everything about good and evil, Nikias. I'm sorry. You've got to lead people in the moment. And on the other hand, you can't have blind obedience and you can't recruit soldiers who just want to prove themselves or you're going to have a, more war than you want, more brutality than you want. So um, so I, I, uh, I knew this was not going well and I fought in the, the wars. I did my duty. Um, but then the city collapsed and they elected Critias. But before the collapse, during the democracy, I was picked to be a juror, just like everybody else. But I realized once I got on the jury that the Democrats in charge had trumped up charges against their political opponents and they wanted us to vote and to support these false charges or inadequate evidence. And I wouldn't do it, right? And then the, the tyrants took over, Critias took over, and I got called in on jury again. And they also were trying to make up this excuse. So in that case, there was um, a shipwreck, a war, and it was the duty of the generals to bury people because you had to, it was very important that a body gets buried so it can go to Hades. And if you don't find that body and you don't bury it, you've condemned someone to eternal nothingness, which is super bad. So these, these people fell off the ship and they drowned, but the accusation was, you didn't bury them, so you're guilty. And I, wait a sec, that's totally me, you know, they're not accountable for that. So Socrates didn't vote with them either. So either side was just hot to trot to get at him because he was the honest guy in the midst of all this using the court system to play politics. Um, so I did that. Um, and then while I was questioning all these people, um, one of my friends went to the Oracle of Delphi. And if you remember, um, uh, the Euthyphro's father also went to the Oracle to find out what to do about the slave. So the Oracle was like the United Nations. It represented international law. It wasn't located in a city state, it was the Oracle whenever a leader wanted to get advice about something, about their city, how to run their city, they would go to the Oracle. So some of the corrupt leaders, they wanted the Oracle to baptize their imperialist war making, you know, because the people wouldn't, their citizens wouldn't do it unless the Oracle had said it was okay. So they went there and they tried to like, you know, <laughs> fudge on what the oracle said. But the oracle always gave a riddle. It never gave you an answer. So the famous example was a ruler who went and asked, should I go to war? And the oracle said, if you go to war, a great empire will be lost. And he goes, yeah, okay, good. That's legitimizing my going to war. Well, his own city was destroyed. And it was like, your own city is this great city that gets destroyed. So that, I mean, everybody knew that story. So make sure you interpret the riddle appropriately because it will come back to you. It's not the Oracle's fault. Now, the reason I like this is because I think all holy books, the Bible, the Quran, the um, Confucius Analects, the Hindu Gita, all these wisdom books, including Plato and Homer, they're intended to be like riddles or you're responsible for how you apply this stuff. You can't come to me, can't blame the book. You have to take responsibility for which quotes you pick and how you interpret them. Don't blame the book <laughs> and don't blame God, right? Via the book. So 
So my friend went to the Oracle and said, I mean, I didn't send him there. He just went and he said, is there anyone wiser than Socrates? So my friend did not say, is Socrates wise? Because nobody is wise. That's a dumb question. He said, is there anyone wiser than Socrates? And the, the oracle said, no. And so uh, what the oracle was telling the Athenians is you're becoming a bunch of arrogant SOBs. You better check, you know, you better get a check on this. And Socrates is your check on this. So, hey, buddy. Anyway, so his friend comes back. He says, no one is wiser than Socrates. And I'm like, I'm a stone cutter. What the heck? I don't know any of this stuff. I'm not a general. I wasn't educated. How can the oracle say no one is wiser than me? So it's a riddle. So, okay, I'm going to solve this riddle. I'm going to go find somebody who's wiser than me. And so I go and I talk to these people and I talk to the generals and I talk to um, Critias, actually. I talk to some of the best and the brightest young people. I talk to the artisans. Um, so I talk to the poets and I tell you about that. So I ask them, this is uh, where I, there's a dialogue where I talk to Ion about this. And so I go and I say, well, what is it that inspires you, right? How do you get that insight to come up with some such beautiful work? And they can't explain it. <laughs> oh, it's mystical or oh, you know, whatever. <laughs> I had a bad hair day and it was kind of inspiring. I mean, they, they can't give a rational account of why their artwork is um, insightful, right? And so the, the implication is you need to tie your artistic revelation or intuition or inspiration to some sort of rational defense because otherwise you can just use your capacity to create stories or whatever to manipulate people. And that's what Ion did. He recited Homer but he did it, um, he, when Socrates says, oh, I am so jealous of you, you get to recite Homer and Homer wrote all this profound stuff. And Ion says, well, I just like it because of the rhythm is so beautiful. I don't think about like the lessons of it. And he gets voted number one, he dresses up. In other words, he turned Homer into entertainment. Nobody's learning the lessons. And then Ion says, he says, when I'm reciting and everybody's crying, I'm, I'm laughing inside because I know this is working and I'm going to get paid. So <coughs> you get paid afterwards based on their performance. And, but if I'm performing and they're, they're laughing at me, then I know I, I, I didn't get it. Like I couldn't punch their buttons. And so all Ion cares about is emotionally um, triggering emotions. It doesn't matter what emotions, there, there's no lesson to learn. And so they don't learn that this is supposed to be cure yourself of this stuff. Don't feel sorry for Achilles, for example. He's, he's rotten, like, he, you know, he thinks he's the big hero. He's actually awful. Um, so they're not getting that message. And then Ion also says he thinks because of his capacity to manipulate people that he ought to be hired as a general because he could stand up in front of soldiers and get them all frothing at the mouth to go fight. But without questioning whether this war is just or this particular campaign is, is appropriate, or whether this particular battle, when they're going into it, is not going to turn into brutal brutalization, right? It's just get them all frothing at the mouth, then that I can do that. And so I deserve to be a general. And I just thought, wow, this is not going well. <laughs> and so I asked the, the poets, where's your inspiration? Well, I don't know, you know. 
Um, so it can just turn into entertainment. It can turn into justifying all sorts of brutal behavior. It can turn into anything. Um, and that's what happened. Well, then I also went to the craftsmen, you know, people who make shoes or make, there's a lot of people who are good craftsmen like Hephaestus. And I certainly appreciate them. Uh, people are good at fixing my computer <laughs> or uh, getting me connected to Wi-Fi when I moved here last year. You know, there's lots of people that have way more technical knowledge. The guy that fixes my car, right? These guys, they have incredible knowledge and skill, and I'm just a total idiot. Um, and I appreciate them very much because they could overcharge me. They could even screw up the stuff and then I'd have to come back to them and pay them again. I mean, they have a lot of authority. So I asked them, you know, the ones that were good. Um, well, they, they were fine when it came to their skill, but then they also voted, right, in the assembly and the jury. And I asked them, well, what is justice? And they, they really, they thought just because they were good at shoemaking, that whatever opinion they had at all about justice was fine, as good as anybody else's. They didn't really try to live examined lives. They just thought, well, I'm a citizen and I'm good at what I do and I make this contribution. Therefore, whatever political opinions I have are perfectly legit. Well, wait a sec. There actually is an intellectual training and activity that you have to cultivate constantly if you really want to make good choices about all the issues that come up, right? Right now we've got Supreme Court issues, we've got Ukraine issues, we've got um, inflation issues, we've got education issues, we've got healthcare issues, we've got um, environmental protection. I mean, there's tons of issues. And so you're supposed to be informed just because you're a good car mechanic doesn't mean your vote is just as legit as somebody who actually keeps themselves informed, even though you are gonna get one person, one vote, which is fine. Who, nobody wants anything other than that. It's just that you must be informed, right? Um, and they didn't, they weren't. Um, and so I, that was kind of looking bad, you know? <laughs> Everything about this was, oh boy, this is not going well. Um, so what happened after the war, um, then Critias took over and then after nine months, he got booted out and the Democrats came back into power. Well, they wanted to find a scapegoat. Somebody's gotta be blamed for this. And so I was the scapegoat. I'm gonna, we're gonna blame Socrates because he humiliated our leaders. He, you know, exposed corruption. And then the young people used to follow me around because it is kind of funny. And because they had trusted all these authorities and now they're getting exposed. And so I'm the one who corrupts them, you know? And then I get accused of teaching things. I didn't teach anything. I always start out asking the person, what do you think? And then I just follow through on it. I don't have any teachings. And people constantly are telling me, are talking about what Socrates taught this. I didn't teach anything. I didn't get paid. I was poor. You know, the sophists are the one that teach the skill of rhetoric. I didn't. But the trouble is when um, at the very beginning of the uh, apology, people had said, had told the jurors, be careful that Socrates has rhetoric, you better uh, avoid him. Well, what that means is that the jurors thought I was a sophist because the sophists have rhetoric. So I tried right at the beginning to disabuse them of that notion. I don't have rhetoric. I don't use rhetoric. I just speak clearly. I'm just gonna give you an honest description of how I have lived. I think I have been the best citizen in Athens, but I am being accused of corrupting the youth and not believing in the city's gods. Well, then the other irony 
was that Melitus, all right. So you remember Euthyphro, he was uh, taking quotes out of Homer to justify taking his father to court for murder, but he liked me, you know, he just thought eh, the masses, they don't know, but that's okay, they'll lose, <laughs> they'll lose, you'll win your case, Socrates, don't worry. Well, he didn't know that, you know, whether or not Euthyphro was just a black and white thinker, maybe he wasn't arrogant, but Melitus <laughs> was a fundamentalist, you know, you don't believe, and he was a bad actor. He was definitely in it for the reputation. And you could tell because of the way he trashed me, right? He said, I said, well, if I corrupt the youth, who educates them? And if you remember, he said, the laws, the institutions, the judges, every citizen, everybody in Athens educates them and only I corrupt them. And also that I was a complete atheist. So this is, Melitus is not interested in nuance. And again, he's, he does not think democratically. He's very black and white, but it's more than that. He's into power, right? Whereas it's, I don't think Euthyphro, he might have been into glory, like he wants this reputation, but he's not playing politics like Melitus is. Um, he wants power, you know, he wants the people who don't agree with them to be killed. Like this is, but it appears the same appearance that these people are pious and they're defending the traditional religious traditions and all this stuff. They're defending family, patriotism and religion. So it, it just seemed pretty obvious to me when Melitus accused me of everything, just flat out. Um, I was the only one that corrupted them. I'm a complete atheist. Um, so then what it was is, can the jury tell the difference between me and a sophist? That's the question. So it's just like, I think it's like uh, the passion play, the uh, final week of Jesus life. You had the Sadducees and the Pharisees were religious leaders, but they were in it for the power, right? Jesus had exposed them as being corrupt and hypocrites. And we will read the Sermon on the Mount. And it, he just says that unless you are more righteous than the Sadducees and the Pharisees, you're going to go, you're going to roast because <laughs> they're a bunch of hypocrites. Well, I mean, that doesn't go over really well with them. And so they use their rhetoric to manipulate the masses into a, a voting against Jesus, right? Same thing happened. And that's why I think the people who wrote the Passion Play, the final week, they were very aware of this tradition. So uh, Melitus is, is trying to convince the jury that Socrates is a sophist. And he's, he's not but they managed, right? The vote was close. And Socrates said, you know, if these other guys hadn't testified, so Anatus testified against him and somebody else testified against him. Um, and the jury, I think it was 30 votes one way or the other out of 200 plus, 260 or something. So it was, it was a lot closer than Socrates thought it was because Melitus made so many cheap shots, you know, and he punched every button in the book. So, um, so I think I want to make sure I've got, I covered everything, the story of my life. Oh, well, the main thing, the message that I want to send to you and posterity is, um, Please try not to be guilty of pride. Try to avoid thinking you know more than you know about anything. Try not to stereotype people. Don't spread false rumors or don't fear people who disagree with you. Try to stay curious and open. Always ready to consider any issue from many angles before you come to a conclusion. And when you come to your conclusion, stay open to somebody who has 
another additional perspective. Um, this doesn't mean you shouldn't love your country and its laws and, and institutions. This is the only way to be so that you have honest laws and institutions. You have to ha keep the rulers accountable. So every citizen should be in the habit of being transparent and accountable, that at any day, somebody could ask any citizen, who are you? What are you living for? What power do you have in the society? Are you using it for the well-being of people? Prove it to me. So you should be able to answer those questions every day. And you should be able to ask them. It's the only way to keep, to maintain a free and open society. Um, and anybody who, who reads Plato's dialogues has to have intellectual freedom because these dialogues would be censored in any kind of authoritarian state, obviously, because they're always questioning authorities. So here you are, you had this incredible privilege of reading Plato. Maintain the, the way to maintain that is to constantly examine yourself. Um, try to avoid shrinking middle class, try to avoid instability. Um, okay, so I, yes, I did have a different interpretation of religion. I had a, I thought it was poetry and I thought it was trying to educate people. It's about people. <laughs> the gods are just representatives of these activities and we're projecting human fantasies, phobias, all that stuff. And the stories tell you, you should, uh, you know, get over that stuff in the back of your mind and um, make sure to live in a way that preserves democracy. So um, let me show you a couple more. I do want you to write about what you think of the Socratic way of life. Do you think He's guilty of corrupting the youth. Do you think he's guilty of not believing in the city's gods? Do you think he's impious or unholy, right? Um, can you think of analogous situations today because where people are criticized for the same reasons because they think like Socrates? Um, actually, I did have a student once in class blurt out, say, well, if this is true, Dr. Beck corrupts the youth. So, so I know definitely that my students know that some of their parents would think that I corrupt. I know that because during um, graduation, I get a lot of dirty looks from parents and I really feel bad about it because I don't, I honestly don't think this is corrupt, corrupting the youth. And I, you know, my life story, I have very tr traditional family values, you know, I married the boy next door, I had three kids. I mean, I'm not, Socrates got in trouble with the liberals and the conservatives because he wanted everybody to be self-disciplined and he wanted everybody to use their power for the sake of the rules. And there were liberals who were degenerate and conservatives who were degenerate. And he got in trouble with all of them. Um, all right, so you need to answer those questions. And really, what I'd really like to do is step back this time and let you guys talk to each other. I keep saying that, and then I keep butting in. But you can tell me. You can raise your hand and say, hey, hey, Dr. Beck, you promised you wouldn't do this. So step back. Really, it's OK. So let's have a hand signal. If you go like this, it means, would you please be quiet and let, and let us talk? This is the signal, right? Makes it look like, yeah, Dr. Beck, cool. And, um, so that would be helpful if you did that. You also have to remind me to record. All right, so here's the, the uh, thing where um, Ryan was already interested in analogies with Jesus, which is great. That's very exciting. And what's interesting about it is that these books have been taught for 2,500 years. And so ever since not long after Jesus died, 
the whole educational system was comparing Jesus and Socrates. And so you are now part of the great conversation, right? You get some of the main texts and main themes of our Western tradition. And our Western tradition is supposedly promotes free speech, freedom of expression, citizen engagement, right? I mean, this, this is it and we're losing it. And uh, yeah, I'm passing it on to you and I hope that you'll pick, take the torch and think it's worth passing on, right? Do you want your kids to live in a free and open society? What do you have to do to get to there? It's, it's not a given, we could lose it. Just like Plato watched the Athenians lose it just within 30 years, I mean, quickly. Okay, so comparisons with the Revolutionary War, um, comparisons, what Socrates was, and then um, Socrates and Jesus, comparisons with that. And so again, I have paper topics because you're gonna have to write papers this weekend, um, but you can always think of your own topic and you can have a conference with me about it. I usually, when I used to be on campus and it was a regular semester, I would require students to come in and talk to me about their paper outline. And I would give you a cheat sheet I'm like interactive cliff notes and you know what that makes it easier and it usually makes your papers better. So I will be available um, and you can contact me about which hours you're available. But anyway, and here's an article about at a certain point in history, uh, campaigns, political campaigns became like um, advertisement, just like salesmanship. There's no issue when it came to selling Ford automobiles. Uh, there was the product, the competition, and the advertising. He saw no reason why politics should be any different. And I really, really think that you need to think about whether politics is nothing more than a brand. Like I, I'm in the Republican brand or the Democratic brand. It has nothing to do with thinking like a citizen and, and also building bridges between all people with different opinions. It all has to do with selling yourself and um, whether a candidate had a good strategy. And there is a guy that gets interviewed on this program and he's all he talks about is brand up, brand down, you know, is the democratic brand, you know, he doesn't even have any qualms about it. Uh, uh, it's, it's hard on me because <laughs> I'm an old lady. Um, let's see, and what else was in here? Anyway, I mean, I really do think you should think about this. Um, it's not what's there that counts, it's what's projected. And definitely you can see people project themselves into a candidate. And the readings we had for the Euthyphro, if you remember Matthew Dowd, said that he was in love with George W and he didn't see him for who he was. So people project their hopes and their fears onto a political candidate or a politician. It tells you a lot more about them than it does about the politician. So you have to be really careful not to do that. You have to really study who is this guy, what's his CV or this woman, what's her CV? What has she done in the past? Has she proven that she is capable of practical wisdom? Anyway, the next one is, this was written, what's the year? Okay, I think it's 2001 before 9-11. And he, and you know, this is a long time ago before cell phones and all that stuff. And he already says, the problem with all this speed uh, and the frantic energy that's spent using time efficiently is that it undermines creativity. Creativity is usually something that happens when you're doing something else. When you're in the shower, your brain has a time to noodle about, to get outside of your fixations and um, add something new to the way you think about things. Of course, this has gotten worse and worse. And, you know, people go onto their internet and they connect with, you know, I don't know, 
whatever political issues or theories they everybody is really caught into a silo and is isolated from other people and we're you know we're losing our capacity to talk to each other um so one thing i i liked about teaching at lion was that we did have students with different points of view and unfortunately a lot of liberal arts schools are like social clubs but lion is not it has a lot of diversity in terms of liberal conservative you might not think so but compared to a lot of other schools it does then this one is about stem um and this i think this is important um plus it just appears in the chronicle and it's just as if dr beck did you bribe somebody to write this article <laughs> it's pretty much exactly what i teach so that's kind of nice um yeah i've always you can't get precision in in public affairs at the level that you can get it in the sciences because human beings do not behave in ways that are regular the way that the natural world does natural world is highly ordered right it's not absolute necessity but it's it's definitely you can predict it a lot better than human affairs well why because people act on their thoughts and they can do things that are totally dysfunctional you know i mean there's no animals <laughs> like birds have nesting instinct right but you know college students if you look at the average dorm room they don't have any nesting instinct they don't have any instinct you know and so human beings can do stuff that is completely irrational and not does not promote their well-being in a way that animals do not like when animals behave they pretty much behave in a way that's going to promote their well-being and their species or their group you know their pack or whatever but human beings oh my god they just do these crazy things and so that's why when you're looking for patterns and that's why my conversation about socrates it's about patterns um, and it's imprecise so i mean i think at some times in my life i think i've been pretty socratic but at other times i've been a raving sophist you know because i i mean i take i've done lousy things um i've abused my training sometimes i just every once in a while i i've intimidated a student just because i didn't really want to talk to them it didn't happen very often but you know i really flagellated myself on that so um you know it's not cut and dried it's this constant process of examining and re-examining lessons learned and um, you think okay i think i learned that lesson and then you find out oh my god i didn't that happened to me last week in a big way um so it's it's difficult that's all i know it's difficult whenever you think oh, i think i have enough character strength i'm not going to make any more mistakes oh boy then you really start making mistakes so um so if you go to the republic in search of concrete answers you're not going to get it because it's a bunch of questions so i do think the reason i got a phd in philosophy is so that i could ask questions <laughs> not so that i would know the answers i get to be the teacher that asks the questions um all right. Um, so Plato, Plato watched this, right? He talked to people who had technological superiority. The Athenians were the best shipbuilders. They were, you know, technologically, they were way up there. But then because of their arrogance and their refusal to admit that they had limitations, they, you know, went off to war against sicily stupidly and things like that um if your aim is primarily money and power um then you're in trouble if it's 
you know, justice and truth. Again, you, you weigh things back and forth. It's not like, uh, it's just mostly that it's not likely that you'll end up having to drink hemlock. And it's also not likely you end up in the street. Um, but I will say at one point in my life, I just about did end up on the street with a little kid. And I wondered what the heck, <laughs> who told me I didn't have to worry about money. Um, but that's a long story. It's just that I don't think that's going to happen to very many of you because it was a whole lot of things that happened before that. Um, so um, the thing that's interesting here, anyway, so that's definitely uh, related to what we've done. Then the next one is about how humanities can help fix the world. And it is also about the value of humanities as opposed to just the STEM uh, uh, disciplines. And so now we have Colin in our class who is a great STEM guy. And so he can decide, I really want to know his opinion. Uh, I want to know it today, you know, tomorrow in class, but I also want to know it by the end of the class because I mean, he might decide, nah, I don't think so. Um, but that's all right. I just want an honest answer. I want students to be honest and to have good reasons because then I learn stuff that I didn't know. Obviously, I teach it as well as I know how to teach it. But, you know, I usually, um, I take the evaluation seriously. It's just that I'm not sure the students always take them seriously. Um, Anyway, one of the things was, I don't know what she wants. It wasn't clear. Well, this is not a class where there are cut and dried answers. And if I did that, I would not be faithful to Plato, you know, or to, I don't think I'd be faithful to my discipline philosophy. But anyway, so this guy um, is talking about uh, the students really didn't know. Uh, what anti-Semitism was or um, didn't know that a racist song might offend somebody. They just thought, well, some people like that song and some people don't. <laughs> really? Okay, so where, where do they learn this stuff? Well, you don't learn it in marketing or economics. I mean, you could take a marketing class and say, well, appeal to fear, appeal to pity, uh, polarize, use religion, and then you'll really be able to sell your product. I mean, that's what these political campaigns do. So hopefully, you know, your marketing classes aren't like that, but they could be like that. If the goal is simply to be successful, religion is a great tool to destroy uh, the common good <laughs> and also democracy. Um, all right, so then he goes through this, uh, the difference between science and how science can be taught just as the love of learning. Um, humanity has to be created. So you literally are creating the world, the person that you wanna be and the society that you want to live in and pass down to your children. And at the end of this, he says, is it possible for a society to be full of young people who are creative, energetic, entrepreneurial, technologically informed, and wholly conformable with mass slaughter? It's like, yeah, check out Germany <laughs> during the Weimar Republic and then turning, voting for Hitler, right? They voted for him. Um, and that's pretty scary. Then this is the one about um, that the universities get too detached from actual boots on the ground, what people are doing. And I'm not quite sure if you've had enough classes to compare your own educational experience with this article, but if you do, um, that's great. And then what moderates believe. So what does it mean to be a moderate? The truth is plural, creativity is syn syncretistic, uh, politics, the lows are lower than the highs are higher, truth before justice, beware the danger of a single identity. Uh, partisanship is necessary, but blind, blinding, like you must keep, uh, you have to debate opinions, but
but not just justify your party's decisions. You really have to stick to reason. Um, what everybody wants, I think everybody wants, is a stable society and, and a middle class. And so the Republican line is that if you cut taxes, that's and you promote entrepreneurism and business, that's how you get it. And the Democrats say, no, money sticks to money. It doesn't work. You have to have a forced redistribution, like taxes or um, tax credits for philanthropy and things like that, because it's not the system is not going to do it on its own. But that's you know a debate. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes social programs don't work. Sometimes they do, right? So you really have to keep keep at it. Uh, humility, right? This is a big thing. Don't think you know what you don't know. Um, and it requires courage, the courage to admit you don't know, which is exactly what they were talking about at the end of the Socrates dialogue with the generals. So. Um, I don't think Mr. Brooks knew how Socratic that his list was. He probably vaguely, if I would tell him, this is very Socratic, and he'd go, yeah, probably is. And then I would give him the specifics, but that's why I love my job. Anyway, so I will see you. It's been a, it's been a little over an hour, I think an hour and what, 20 minutes, but I'll see you tomorrow. And um, I guess we'll start out with comments you want to make, but if all else fails, was Socrates guilty or not, and why? Um, so uh, take care and looking forward.